uh, as you can tell, the board is clean. <laughs> Heard that one person back there, oh. <laughs> um, I would like to, to proceed um, into the book of Revelation today. We've gone through the seven churches. And um, I've tried to make, in each one of these messages, make a kind of standalone point. We had a somewhat of a summary, we worked on the concept of overcoming. And here's where it gets just a little bit sticky. So, you know, I have this interesting task. Um, even churches that don't have traditions have traditions. Does that make sense? We can say we don't have traditions because traditions make void the word of God. But even in a church without traditions, you end up sometimes having traditions or you end up carrying traditional baggage. Um, and so I want you to understand there's going to be things that I'm going to deal with that they have to be said in a certain way so that you and I are free to approach the scripture in, we'll call it in the most uh, literal way, and not bring with us too much traditional baggage. Now, traditionally, and I'm, I'm just going to say this at the beginning, traditionally, the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation Traditionally, in Pentecostal, Protestant, Pentecostal, Charismatic, but the, certainly the Protestant, Protestant tradition, for the most part, not, not every group, but for the most part, teaches that John is a type of the church that is raptured and caught up into heaven. Now, what I want to say before I get into the fourth chapter, which is where we're going today, and we're going to look at the mystery and the majesty of the throne in heaven and some of the things that are seen there. What I want you to know as I go forward is there are some things that are self-evident. We don't need special interpretation to help us out here. Uh, at the close of the third chapter, the church is not spoken to anymore. The third chapter ends, and then after this, I looked and behold, a door was open. So there are certain things we can say axiomatically, and that is that the church is not being addressed anymore. Just put a period there. And as we progress into the book, it will become clear that the church must be somewhere. Um, John is, is given the privilege to see something. And this is where, if you ask the grammarians, just those people whose specialty it is, who study the Greek language, they'll tell you that um, as John, early on in the book, says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and then again here, that he was, uh, a door was open, and you know, it, the, the essential thing is that he's, he must be in the spirit. Um, the issue is, for the grammarians, that the... the Greek rendering of in the spirit is anothrous. That means it has no definite article. There is no the. There is no I was in the spirit. And that has left a lot of people saying, well, John could have been in a vision and transported in his vision, much like Paul was. Paul was transported, and he says, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body. So to put too much weight on whether he was physically transported, the most fundamental thing is that he was given these things to see. Regardless of if his body was physically transported or not. Now, when we read it closely, when somebody says, come up here, uh, come up hither, it's pretty hard to imagine that come up hither is come up, come up hither in your mind, like, you know, Who's that guy that does all the car commercials? You know, he's driving and he's talking. Matthew McConaughey. 
You know, picture John on the Isle of Patmos like Matthew McConaughey, and there's like a voice, and the voice has come up hither. But nothing's moving here. There's nobody around him. You know, you could make that, you could make a good cause to say he heard things, but then you'd also make him into a lunatic. Now, he heard things that, that it was given to him to see and to hear. And how we know that is because back there in Revelation 119, he is told, Revelation 119, gosh, why do I always end up on the red? He's told to write the things which most have said, this is the key to the book, which thou hast seen. Just writing like the King James, which thou hast seen, right? And the things which are which are so we have here past, we have here present, and the things which shall be hereafter, hereafter, future. And in the Greek, this, this meditata, after these things. So when we come to the opening of the fourth chapter, after this, you're going to read again, meta tauta, after these things, after this, which again will appear in 7.1, the same, same Greek, after these things, and in 15.5, it just repeats itself. So what we know is that John was given to write down the things which he saw, the things which are, and the things which would be revealed to him. So what I want us to do is approach this in a way that we don't start trying to put things in the book that aren't there. And on the flip side, proper Bible interpretation, even, this is why I tell you, it took me 10 years to tackle, 10 years of ministry to, t to begin tackling this book because so many times I have seen and I have read commentators and commentaries where things are added. And they're either added because of their background, their denominational background, or the school they went to that had a certain predisposition towards certain things. What we're reading here, it's why it's called the book of Revelation. It was revealed to John. So what, that's kind of what I want you to see. Now, here we go into the fourth chapter, Meditata. After this, I looked... And behold, a door was open in heaven. Let me just stop right there. See, when we read this, we tend, our minds tend to drift. Like, you know, he looked, he saw, and a door was open. Now, why do we read this like this, and we get strange? The gears in our brain begin to act strange. And yet, when we read in Matthew 3.16, after Jesus' baptism, it says, and heaven was open. And a voice spoke, and, uh, like a dove descending. We don't, the gears aren't as strange there as they are here, as, as John says, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And if you think about it, the same type of gear should be applied to Matthew 3, 16, after Jesus' baptism, where it, essentially the heavens open. And equally in John 1, 51, where after Philip and Nathaniel find Jesus, Jesus says to both of them, don't think this is anything spectacular. Verily, verily, as the King James says, from this point forward, you're going to see angels ascending and descending. The heavens open and angels ascending and descending onto the Son of Man. Tell me what's more bizarre, watching angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man or John looking up and seeing a door that was open in heaven? Hmm. So you got to switch gears a little bit and don't read this book like, you know, John's a lunatic because it's the, this type of language is peppered through the book. And then we're dealing with apocalyptic literature. And I don't mean literature as in, you know, some writing somebody's addressed. But if you read through other ap apocalyptic sources, including Daniel, passages of Daniel, you will find similar type language. So we have to just say safely, certain things are confirmed. 
Now, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Hold that thought for a minute. Just hold that thought for just one minute. Because back there in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now again, I point this out because not in this message, but certainly in, in a future message, I, I started working on this concept because it's really bothered me tremendously of what people have done. We'll read in this book how there will be seven trumpets to sound. And the Greek word, as it is repeated, is the same Greek word for the seven trumpets as it is in other parts of the book where it says, at the last trump. Now, again, here's where I just have to pause for a second and say there are people who have held traditional interpretations that will make one thing mean one thing over here, but when it says the last trump, I want you to think trumpet, the last sound to be uh, sounded. Not the last trump in our minds of how we think the last sound will be when it is sounded, but the ultimate and final one, which this book talks about. You cannot do proper Bible interpretation by making it mean one thing over here and something elsewhere. So in a future message, we have to deal with this. And we have to deal with it on a mature way. If, if there's no ego involved here, if a person in the pulpit does not have any ego, and it's all about finding out what exactly this says and what exactly it means for us, then we can all learn. We can all walk away today and say there's something that we can all glean. If you have an ego, and you don't like what I'm saying because you have a pet theory, then chances are you're going to block out the rest of what I'm saying. And I'm going to give you about one minute, maybe 30 seconds, to get up right now because the rest of what I'm going to say today won't help you at all. The door's right there if you'd like to leave. Going once, going twice, gone. It must mean you must want to listen to what I have to say. And I say, listen, I, 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 say, I say that, I say that, Listen to me, I say, I don't say that to be smug or to be rude. I say that because the difficulty of piercing through baggage is really tough. And this is like, this is like a learning higher education. You want to call it a classroom, college, or university style. I'm not interested in people sitting and evaluating what I'm saying because the things I'm saying do not come from my personal opinion. If I were to give you my opinion, I take this guy's message. He has a message he wanted to deliver about 10 years ago. I won't embarrass him. But he had, a, he, had a he had a message he wanted to deliver to the church 10 years ago. Five words, one sentence, right? Right? And it wasn't a good one. So uh, I think you Can I tell him? <laughs> no. So after I'm done preaching today, you can, go all, you can all go ask him. I know you all want to ask him now. My point is, it's really difficult to get through the stuff of even the most liberated thinker. So let's try this here. He hears a voice like a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Here's that metatauta. This is what must happen. Now, I want you to think about something. It says, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one, that's italicized because it's not there, but one sitting on the throne, one sat on the throne. Now, let me just stop right there. This book is going to be this book will make a lot more sense if you think of what John is now seeing. I want you to think about this. The throne room, I'm going to call it that briefly, okay? I want you to think of the throne room as the master control, where essentially every 
type of thing is discharged. You know, we have a, we have a, a booth back there. The director is directing. We would call that director's booth. We used to have one area called master control where from everything, every phone that rang, anything that came, anything that came in or out of the building went from master control. So I want you to think of this throne room right now as master control. And what John is about to see and the things that will be revealed to him are both the things in heaven, in the master control room, and as well as being able to see what's happening in the master control room in heaven, he's also being able to see below him now to earth. Now, it's a strange way of describing it, but it's the best way to catch what will happen as at times we are in heaven and other times we're seeing things happen on earth, yet, yet John himself has not been transported back to earth immediately in his vision or in his body. We're not discussing that today. So what he sees, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And this is kind of a pretty important um, description that is, is being given. And I'll justify what I'm going to say in a minute. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, in at the end of the book, you don't have to turn there, but I'll see if I can find it here. All right. Um, what is being described here, like unto a jasper, is also described in the new city in the 21st chapter. I'll read it to you. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So hear me out on what I'm going to say. This stone, if you will, must represent something. They're not just random, uh, random colors. And the sardine stone, which is like ruby red. Now, I believe very firmly that all the things that we will see have connections to things that have already been revealed to us. So we might talk, for example, of the Jasper Stone as being symbolizing the holiness or the purity of God and the Sardine Stone as the, the color of redemption. But I also want you to know that these stones are also prefigured and described as stones belonging to, in I believe it's Exodus 28, to Reuben, who is the firstborn, and Benjamin, who is whose name meaning son, Reuben, behold a son, and Benjamin, son of my right hand. These stones belong to them, typifying in the breastplate the first and the last. So when we talk about these, uh, what the one who was sitting on the throne looked like, there is a a Hebraism, which is not to describe God, because even in John's day, to write down or to describe God, in, even in a Jewish frame, was forbidden. One didn't do that. Even if you read the descriptions of Christ, they're rather still ambiguous. But what is being described is essentially is the first and the last parts of the stones within the breastplate. And when we talk about this, there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And emerald, we know, is the color of the tribe of Judah. And the, the rainbow itself was the symbol. We know God put a rainbow in the sky for Noah. Only we know what it takes for a rainbow to be. There had to be a storm and sunlight to bring a rainbow. But this rainbow, if you read it in the Greek, is encircling. It goes all the way around, a symbol of God's covenant. And ironically, as judgment was upon the face of the earth in Genesis 9, and God said, never again, this is my covenant that I will not again do this thing. I will not flood the earth. If you think about it, what was put there for man to see is only a half of what encircles the throne, typifying God's covenant relation. When we talk about forever, O Lord, we've quoted that, Psalm 119. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. All things that have been uttered by God in the ears of man have their reality in the heavens. And here we have the, the absoluteness of God's covenant circling the throne and, as it says, in the sight like unto an emerald. So I, it's not a mistake. We talk about you'll find these colors again. 
In fact, I should have done this. I will probably do this in a future message to talk about colors and numbers in Revelation. They represent things. They're not just allegorical or fun. You know, they're things that might be important for us as we understand how the writer is processing and seeing this information and writing it down. Now, if we want to talk about, as I said, the stones, the first and the last, or if we want to talk about the emerald as the stone of the tribe of Judah, but the most important thing we're seeing is the full circle, the full complete covenant around the throne. And if there was any part of this message I'd say we could stop here and we could camp out on, is if you remember I taught out of Hebrews about it, approaching the throne. And I want you to think that when one really attaches the idea of approaching the throne of God, God is a keeper of his word. And that, that what is the Greek word, by the way, for, for the, the uh, rainbow, could also be termed as halo, but it's a full circle, it says God is a covenant-keeping God. And we know that when he gave the first covenant, in the first covenant there was the revelation and the promise of the second. We know that because way back there in Genesis, God knew the redemption for humanity would require something more. Man in his heart was evil and something more would be required. So when we look at this, we see God as a covenant keeper sitting on the throne, his covenant around him. And I also wanted to think of something else. In Genesis, like as in nature, scientifically we know, we know what it takes for a rainbow, light reflecting off of water, however that, that uh, we say after a storm, this happens. And I want you to think that what is being described is the storm is yet being, the storm is yet to be described on earth. But the beauty of the covenant is around the throne. So just kind of keep that in your mind. And then here we go. Around about the throne were four and 20 seats. Please do me a favor if you weren't listening to me when I taught on festival. Put somewhere that seats are the same word for throne. I don't know why the King James people felt it was important to change the word, but there are 24 thrones around the throne. And 24 elders will be sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So if you can think of this, there is a throne, there is a circle around the throne, and the one that sat in the throne, his appearance, if you will, likened unto this crystal clear jasper, these two colors, first and last, if you want to call them purity and redemption, and the green representing the tribe of Judah, and 24 thrones around the throne. This is the way the Greek reads very clearly, with 24 elders. Hold that thought. Because now here's where the fun begins. Well, you might say, well, I wasn't having fun at all. Good. <laughs> didn't say you had to. I said you're supposed to be here to learn. Now let's find a page that I can write on. New page. There we go. All right. What I, what I want you to know, I just finished telling you seats in verse 4 should read thrones. Throne. That's that same Greek word. And then John sees 24 elders. Okay. Elders. Now, I've heard people say all kinds of stuff. Who are these people, these 24 elders? and why they use the word elders, which is a good question, but we do much better to look at this from the Greek frame. This will be, I believe, a great help. So um, I'm going to just write phonetically for a minute. And I'm going to start from the, er the shortest cognate in the Greek and work forward. So. Presbia, which if you're a strong person is 4242. In Luke 14 and 32 is translated, I believe, in the King James as ambassage. And in Luke 19, 14 as message. P 
Rezbuo. Remember, I'm writing phonetically. Strong's 42:43 is what I've referenced often from 2 Corinthians 5:20, where Paul says, "We are ambassadors for Christ." I want you to keep watching. Same word. Presbuterion. Luke 22, 66 is one of them. And Acts 22, 5, the estate of the elders. In Greek, a lot of times where you get terion usually is the place of something being carried out. Could sometimes be the activity. Boy, you're going to like this next one. I'm, going to, I'm just going to do a Scott thing right here, just right from the top. Okay, here I guarantee you, you will not forget this word. Men and women, you will not forget this word, believe me. All right, here we go. In fact, I'm going to uh, hyphenate it. There's no hyphen in it, but I want you to see the stress. That is old men. <laughs> Can you read that? What does it say? <laughs> it happened in church. I'm telling you, it happened in church. And for aged women, lest you ladies feel a little left out today, here it comes. So, for all the booties and the booties out there. <laughs> you heard in church. You went to church today, what'd you learn? Well, the old men, are, they got a bunch of booties, and the old women, well, they got booties too. Huh. Now, why am I telling you this? Because all of these words end up with our word, you've heard, the presbytery, presbyterians, right? Now, all that means we've translated this as elders. But if you can see, going back to this first one here and to this second one, ambassadors, ambassadors, messengers, those on a mission with a message from God, uh, ambassage, same thing, carrying the same thing, um, and then later on, older people in the church who have a message or messengers, they are not sent ones. They're not apostles. They're not sent ones, but they may have a message. Now, why is this important? Because there are other Greek words representing old. We get our word archaic from a Greek word, archaos. There's another word for old. We get our English word for ger gerontology. Uh, geron, age. So there are other words, but this one has to do with, and a, a better way to do this would, would be to look at it from the Indo-European. Um, Proto-Indo-European breaks it down as in the prefix pres, which is before, plus, uh, this might not make sense, but gu, which is to go before. To go before, sorry, this is go before. If you want the, oh boy, you're going to like this. If you want the, eti the common etymology traced to presby, not Presbyterian, but presby, if you trace that back, uh, it comes out to something very strange. The word presby you were trying to find the etym etymology of this, uh, I did not make this up before the cows. <laughs> Our common use of the word priest, for example, has a bifurcated split. And out of, out of that bifurcation, priest actually is a cognate of presbyter. And in its probably in its truest meaning is not from prayer or one who prays, but from the same word groups. So I want you to think about where we're going with this. So every time it mentions, mentions the elders, there's a reason why I went through this labor. 
because I have heard people say that these elders being referenced in Revelation 4 onward could be angels. But no angel has ever been clothed by God in white. And no angel, as you'll find, these elders are wearing crowns. And the crowns that they are wearing are not the diadem of a potent, potentate. They are, the di they are the stephanos of the crown of a victor, those who have overcome. So when we talk about these elders, we know a few things about who they are. And many have tried to say that because there are 24, could they represent 12 from the old and 12 from the new? And I'm going to tell you, I don't think it's like, it's like the prayer, you know, our Father, who is in heaven? <laughs> I don't think anybody knows who these 24 are, but the thing we can know is whether they represent 12 from the old and 12 from the new, it says clearly that these are those who, re, who were redeemed uh, from, we'll, we'll read this in a few minutes here because I'm going to get to the passage, but they were redeemed out from among those of the earth. Furthermore, um, they have a specific function. Now we could talk about the number 24, and in numbers in this book are very important. You're going to see a lot of sevens and a lot of twelves, these are the numbers that repeat themselves. Seven, of course, is perfection or completion. Twelve might be perfect government. We might talk about the number 12 in a diversity of ways in this book. So 24 here could be, we could talk about six and four. That's the, six is the number of man and four the whole earth. These 24 representing the redeemed men as a type from the whole earth, or they could represent divine manifestation, number three and eight, the number of new beginnings. We could, you could divide that any way you want, and I don't really know that there's going to be a hard answer for that, or two times 12, uh, adequate witness. So however that is, but probably the most important thing that I would say to you about the number 24 is if you remember back in 1 Chronicles 24 and 25, we were shown the courses of the priests, and there were 24 there. And we're looking at something in heaven that is the revelation of what we're going to call the, the Holy of Holies. So if you want to say these, these elders, these, these are human beings as, as distinct from beasts and angels that will be around the throne. But the important thing is to understand these are the same word that we're using for elders here is the same word that's being used elsewhere to describe people. So let me stop here for just a second. I think a lot of times we have people who caricature what heaven must be like. Now Jesus, when he was asked by his disciples, what word are they going to get? And he said, you know, after they've forsaken everything, it would be given to them to sit on the 12 thrones judging all Israel. That's a passage out of the New Testament. And I think, again, the, the caricature pops into the mind, and we can't really fathom that these are actual people who obviously died and are alive and are around the throne and are yet living and live forever as an abundant witness to all of the spectacle and splendor of what's going on around the throne. So I ask you a question before I read on. If these are actual people, and I believe these are actual people, and they are alive, it should almost bring you and I to go back and read the passages where Christ talks about the promise of eternal life. Here, are, here is John, who has not yet died. Maybe he thinks he died, but he's not yet died, and he's seeing, whether in or out of the body, but he's seeing these elders, these presbyters, around the throne. And they have their victor's crown already. And they're clothed in white raiment, which only Christ can give to them. So you think about that for those people who ponder and say, well, the time is short and uh, not, much, not much to go on here. You know, uh, the things that were promised are slim pickings. Well, then you, must, you, you need to take a little bit better look at what's being said here because it's quite revelatory of what awaits those who trust Christ. But here we have 24 elders clothed in white raiment. 
They had on their heads crowns of gold. And by the way, read anywhere you want. I've never read about angels, as I said, being clothed in white raiment, nor wearing those crowns of victors. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And we're talking about a picture of the triune God. And what John is first seeing is he sees God the Father. He's seeing the Spirit, which is now the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, these four beasts are living beings. And I want to make the distinction here. These beasts are zoa, not theron. That word theron we used elsewhere in the book to describe beast as in terrible beast. These are just living creatures full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. The second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now these descriptions were taken by Arrhenius, who was the first to propagate that these represented each the Gospels as they were written. And whether that be true or whether the imagery itself is out of Ezekiel, which has a similar description. And I prefer, by the way, to tell you, as it's not my intent today to go off on this, because we need a message just for this, but you'll find patterns that are repeated in the Bible for a reason. If you're just randomly reading Ezekiel, some of the things in Ezekiel are like, whoa, Ezekiel probably ate the same type of mushrooms John did. That's good <laughs> stuff, right? But the reality is he's seeing the same thing, and these lived at radically and definitely different times. Isaiah is another one of these. In Isaiah's case, if you remember, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the throne. He sees the trail or the train. Uh, and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the seraphim. There was a lot of um, things that the seer saw that they will all see in common and why, and I say this is very important, because what was revealed to some, not all, but what was revealed to some, John is now seeing the reality of the revelation that these wrote about. And that's what I like about this. If you're going to read this book, Read it with that mindset. This is the last book of the Bible where John is being exposed to what I've called the master control up there, where all things are dispatched from. So he's seeing the authentic, real thing. He's not seeing the hypothetical or even the vision-like on earth. He's seeing it right there with his own eyes. So he sees these four uh, living beings with eyes all over and the likeness being described already. And the four living beings had each of them six wings, which is why I referenced uh, Isaiah. Isaiah saw a similar thing. Uh, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So the four living creatures have a song that they sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which, which was, which is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who living forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, those we've just described, presbyters, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's very interesting. Don't, don't think chapter and verse. There was no chapter and verse. We're only looking at this to understand about these, the function of what's going on before the throne. So keep reading with me. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within on the back side and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. So here now we have a reference to elders who are people, living creatures, living 
beings and angels. And here we have a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now think on these things. No man in heaven, no man in earth or under the earth. Nobody. Not a one. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So here, here is, this is the message for those people who are so mighty in their own minds here is the revelation. There is no person worthy and only one. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the line of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David. And we went over this on festival when we talked about the word Nike. E Nike. It's one of those Nike words, hath prevailed the King James to open the book. He overcame and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living beings, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Pause right there for a second. Because what, what John is seeing now, he, he has seen what no man has seen ever. Christ said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No man has ever seen, even unto this day. And John is seeing the triune God. He's seeing everything all at once. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living beings, the beasts, and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, and golden vials full of odors, and no, it didn't smell its incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. What did I just tell you about these folks who cast their crowns down, began to worship. These are the redeemed ones. And this is just a small number representing, that's why I said to you, I, I do not believe this is a representation of all the redeemed of all times, but a number that's important to God. Redeemed and made us kings and priests. Isn't that what Peter talks about in 1 Peter 2, when he talks about a royal priesthood, holy unto God, the beginning of which, when we, be, we begin to put all this scripture together, we realize there's a greater purpose here. Now, these people, obviously, and this whole scene around the throne is unfolding to give us an understanding about the praise that happens around the throne. And this is what John is seeing. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, the living creatures, and the elders. That tells you distinct uh, entities here, not a homogenization of things. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. A vast number, not even, we can't even count what that is, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as in the sea and all of them and all that are in them heard, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts, the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down, seems they do a lot of that, and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now don't move. Don't move away from this. Still unfolding. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. So all of this, you've got to keep the mindset that there is this, this incredible worship 
around the throne, the mystery of the throne, the thrill, what John is seeing, the throng that's around the throne, and we don't even move away from that. We move immediately into the opening up of the seals. Now, a lot of times, and I really don't want to get too much involved in the seals. I want to go somewhere else to show you something about these folks, uh, the, the elders. That's my focus today. But a lot of times, people will chop this book up so badly, John has not yet left the spectacle of the worship and what he just saw and what we just described, and he moves directly into now this thing is taking place, and the seals, the lamb is going to begin to open the seals, which basically unleash the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, as I said, you almost got to park the thought process for a minute and realize that these elders, these presbyters have a function and they are the, we'll call them the, 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 the praise team in glory. I know like when people talk about, you know, music in the church and they say, oh, our praise team. And I think to myself, that's no, I don't care how much you sing here and how much you think you're singing, it's not a praise team. It's a praise team when, the, when these people are falling down before the throne and prostrating themselves and tossing their crowns off their head and they exist just for that purpose alone versus a half an hour, an hour, or even two or three hours in the church if, if people could survive that, which I don't think they could. Uh, now, why am I telling you this? Because there's, there's, there's actually much more to this that I want to take you to about these elders. So if you keep moving, and I, I don't want to get into what happens now, my goal is to just show you something about these elders. And we're moving through to the seventh chapter. And I'd like to tell you something that's revealed a little bit more about these. After the 144,000 or the 12 thousand of each tribe, save Dan, is called out. It says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white, white robes and palms in their hands, cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and the elders and the four beasts, the four living creatures, fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Now think of this, because earlier we read about those who are redeemed. Now listen to this. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. The King James is very polite. He said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall no more hunger, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them unto the living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now these elders are still part of beholding all the things that are, we'll call, what's coming into the master control, what's happening what is coming in? What's, it's like a rescue, if you will, of people being brought in. These elders and the living creatures and the angels are all witnessing all this. These are the witnesses affirming and testifying and giving glory to God, seeing the spectacle of salvation, which has now come to the reality that is where they are. So if you keep building on this, you realize these elders are performing a function in heaven. And if you keep reading, you'll find them again. And here we are in chapter 11. Now, I'm not trying to lay a chronology today. I'm just trying to show you what these folks have a pattern of doing. 
after the two prophets of God have come to earth, have preached, have laid in the street, are dead and then uh, taken up. And then there's a great earthquake, a tenth part of the city falls, uh, 7,000 people die. And beginning in verse 14 of the 11th chapter, it says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Don't get caught up in these things. I'll explain them later. I want you to focus on the elders. The seventh angel sounded. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats, on their thrones, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy, thy great power and hast reigned. And if you just kind of think about this. Each one of these is a depiction of worship. Again, come with me to the 14th chapter. You'll see it again. You know, some people think heaven is where you do nothing. All these elders do, these 24 are designated to do one thing, praise and worship, real praise and worship. In the 14th chapter of the same book, we have here again the 144,000 are with the Lamb on Mount Zion having the name of their father, of his father's name written in their foreheads, heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, the living creatures, and the elders. No man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So think of this. Now, the elders are listening to the worship and to this song which no man can know, which is the song of the 144,000 redeemed. And we have here another form, if you want to call it, of them watching praise unfolding. And each time we encounter these these elders, we see worship. Chapter 19, and then I'll be done. I'll bring this to a close. After these things, that's where I started with, metatauta in the Greek. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven, in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts, the living beings, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And the voice came out from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants and all that fear him, both small and great. And we, we could just keep building on this because there is an abundant uh, picture. But the greatest thing that I can say here is these are called for a purpose in heaven. To give praise, to rejoice, to celebrate. Now, I know many of you have read the parable, for example, of uh, the lost sheep. And Jesus goes after the one and he says, and there's rejoicing in heaven. And he's speaking of the angels, but I guarantee you there's rejoicing in heaven with these redeemed around the throne each time somebody hears, or we'll say, we'll say it like the parable, is taken up upon the shoulders and carried by Christ into, we'll call it the bosom of the beloved. In every single dimension of this book, these elders have a function. So next time, because I, I am out of time today to go on and describe some of the things I wish to give details on that we've looked at. What I want you to know is these elders have a purpose, and their purpose is to worship, which brings me to a kind of conclusion of sorts. When people talk about the worship that is done in churches or people's worship in their home, I want you to think about the throne that we've looked at today and the imagery to me, is abundantly clear. There is praise constantly going up and circulating and worship that is not lip service, that is not I feel happy today, 
so I'll do it right now in the moment. But these commissioned, my question is, if all of what we do down here is training for eternity, then maybe we should start learning how to praise and worship. And we're talking about praising Him and think about that throne and what it means to actually give glory to the one who lives and whoever liveth still right now who makes intercession for us, who will be at that place. We will stand before him. We will see his splendor. We'll see the sights that John saw. And when we see them, when we see him, the scripture says we shall also be like him. Now, I don't know... If you can get inspired, I was very inspired in looking just simply at the elders and understanding these are not angels, these are not crazy beings, these are people who have been redeemed for a purpose, and their purpose is to praise. Now, we've been redeemed here on earth, and we have a purpose too, and that purpose should begin with praise. So I'm going to ask you, as you consider what I've talked about today and as we progress through the book which some of the concepts may not be as simple as what I dealt with today, I really want you to think about the fact that in all things, we should give him praise. The last psalm says, let everything that hath breath give him praise. Praise the Lord. I wonder how much praise you have given him today for the ability to be here and to be able to open up the word of God and share some part of this word today and say glory to God for the desire that's in me to want to learn more about what yet awaits and what's going on right now that I cannot yet see or the future things that are yet to happen, but I will praise him with every fiber of my being, and I hope he will begin to do the same. And that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.